Pulled up to the scene in a 65 Bentley, dripped in Brioni, China doll with me, looking like a supermodel, oh what a feeling, 25 years old, 25 million, today's the audition for the Godfather part, my life's already a movie so when do I start, I walk up in Patsy's East 119th Street, Fat Tony Salerno gets a kiss on the cheek, I know my way around, not my first time here, been doing overnight cigarette loans for 10 years, I say hello to Danny Pagano and Tough Tony, Nicky Domino gives me a nod, they all know me, they ask why I'm there so early, I say the part, they say what part? I say the movie, why not? I don't look like Carlo, they all begin laughing 3 p.m. ready for the lights, cameras, action Gianni, get in your zone My name is Gianni Russo, a.k.a. Carlo The infamous son-in-law from The Godfather I'm now known as the Hollywood Godfather And this is my story. Welcome everybody, another episode of Hollywood Godfather And tonight, before we introduce our esteemed guest who's been on before, Jeannie Raymond, our co-host. Hey, everyone. Hello. Pat, my co-writer, co-everything. Yeah. <laughs> Pat Piccarelli, please. I see. Hi, everybody. And our guest, you've known him. You've listened to our show numerous times. You've read so many great things about him. Mark Shaw is back with us with more information about the Kennedy assassination. Yeah, I'm surprised I'm here, frankly, because I missed all this. I, I didn't know about some of the things that I'm going to talk about here. But uh, what I've uncovered, I believe, uh, for the first time, changes everything about the JFK assassination from now on. For anybody who's doing research, anybody who has theories, whatever it may be, because I have absolute proof. We've speculated and speculated and speculated, but absolute proof of corruption at the Warren Commission. Oh, and, really? Uh, you and I, I've been saying that for years. <laughs> well, I know, but I, I think, it, just bear with me, because I do believe that I've got that. And it's, gonna, it's going to come around to, to four sources that I have, and they're all very, very credible. One is this man, Morris Cooper, or excuse me, Morris Wolf, who I introduced to you when I talked about the book uh, uh, Fighting for Justice uh, the last time I was on. Right. Uh, I'll talk about him. We're going to talk about Senators John Sherman Cooper, who's in this photograph on uh, Fighting for Justice, and Senator Richard Russell, who's right here. And, of course, my dear guiding light, Dorothy Kilgallen. There you go. And blessed, blessed on, based on their uh, accounts of what happened. And remember, what I always say is all these experts out there who have talked about the assassination and written all these books and everything, they weren't there in, in, uh, when all this happened. Dorothy Kilgallen was in Dallas. She was at Daly Plaza. She was at the trial. She interviewed Jack Ruby. We'll talk about that. Senators Cooper and Russell were members of the Warren Commission. It's right here. That's who they were. And what I've been able to do is to piece together exactly what happened uh, when JFK died, from the very moment he died, based on these sources I'm talking about. What we have to do, and what I'd like for you to do, is go back into the mind of J. Edgar Hoover at that time. So JFK is killed. And there's Hoover out there thinking, well, wait a minute, maybe they're going to say that the FBI should have stopped this. Maybe they're going to say that I knew who could have done this. I mean, all of those things could have come to him. So what did he do, first of all? He starts shouting, Oswald alone, Oswald alone, Oswald alone. He tells the Justice Department, we have to convince the American public that Lee Harvey Oswald killed the president and acted alone. Well, what's the next thing he does? He confiscates all of the Dallas Police Department files, which I've shown through my research, and Dorothy interviewed the chief of police, Jess Curry, they took all of those and sent them to Washington. Third, what did he do? Without any right to do so, he removed JFK's body from Dallas. He was saying that, hey, the, uh, the killing of a president is not a state crime, which was bull. It was a state crime. And sent that body back to Washington, D.C., where an autopsy uh, was done, it was described by Dr. Cyril Weck, uh, the, the, the best forensic scientist we ever had, as the worst one he's ever seen in 60,000 of them. So that's what he does. Now he's got to clean up some other things. He, he, he knows that Texas 
uh, Texas Attorney General may investigate the JFK assassination. He knows that Congress is putting together a group of people to investigate the assassination. We can't let that happen because uh, obviously uh, Hoover has a lot of skeletons in his closet. So he gets together with his buddy, LBJ. They live very close to each other in Washington, D.C. when LBJ is there. And they say to themselves, we have got to put together a commission that will investigate the JFK assassination, one that we can control. So I found the audio tapes of discussions between them about who they're going to put on the on the uh, on the panel on the uh, commission. The first thing is that they want to make sure those are people they can control because all they want investigated is Oswald alone and nothing else. And I'll explain more about that later. So who do they choose? Well, first of all, they choose Jerry Ford. And on the audio tapes, they choose him because LBJ says that man can't walk and chew gum at the same time, which may very well have been true, uh, even when he was president. They put on there Alan Dulles, which is the first clue everybody should have gotten of corruption at the Warren Commission, because you remember, he was head of the CIA, and then JFK fired him two years before JFK was killed. What's he doing on the commission? Well, we'll learn why. He then put on there other members that he thought could um, could go along and be controlled. He had Earl Warren, who was kind of a milk toast uh, uh, chief justice of the Supreme Court, who they can control, put his name on there, the Warren Commission, so it gives it authenticity. And then they picked these two senators, Senator Cooper, a Republican from Kentucky, and Senator Russell, a Democrat from Georgia, to fill out the group. So now they've got their uh, commission, but what they've got to do is to be able to go ahead and make sure that the only thing that commission is going to investigate is the Oswald alone situation. So what happened then is, and I think we talked about this some before, I was able to go ahead through Mr. Mr. Wolf, this man, and find out what was going on behind the scenes at the Warren Commission. And you may remember that I told you that Morris Wolf was a very distinguished scholar. He was a, a lawyer, uh, at, uh, graduated with Yale, at Yale. Uh, he was uh, uh, a man of, of, of uh, a man of integrity, a man who had uh, taken on representing while he was a lawyer, Raul Wallenberg, who was the uh, the Hungarian Jew who saved all of the lives of those people during the uh, during uh, you know the war. Uh, he defended him, tried to get him out of a Russian prison. I mean, this was a stand-up guy. And one morning last year, I think it was in about February or March, I had a message from him, an email that said, Mark, I want to talk to you because I knew Dorothy Kilgallen. Well, well as you can imagine, I mean, especially you, Patrick, when you're an investigator and a historian, whatever it may be, when you hear something like that, it, it just perks up your ears because not too many people are around anymore that knew Dorothy Kilgallen. This is going back 60 years. Yep. So he, so I, I called him, and he just starts in. And unfortunately, I could not record his material because what he told me, because I was just listening so much to what he said. And the first thing he said is, well, Mr. Shaw, I have to tell you that I uh, worked for Robert Kennedy when he was attorney general. I got that job through a Yale law professor. And I worked for RFK as the attorney general, and I worked with him on the Civil Rights uh, Act. I actually wrote Title II of the Civil Rights Act, uh, which passed finally in Congress. And one of the uh, senators that helped pass that, by the way, was Senator Cooper that we'll talk about. Uh, I did that with him. And I can tell you, and he gave me insights into uh, JFK and uh, Bobby Kennedy. He said, you know, they were, they were very playful with each other. He said, uh, but uh, JFK was uh, jealous of Bobby Kennedy getting too much publicity at times. I mean, he, he would tell me things like when I walked into Robert Kennedy's office, he would sit there with his shirt sleeves up and his tie unloosened, and he'd go back like this, and sometimes his chin would move when he got real nervous. Now, anytime you're interviewing a source, as you know, uh, Patrick, you, you look for the little things that they tell you that, that give credibility to what they're saying. So he said, well, I worked for Senator Kennedy. I did all that. And then that time was done. And Senator Kennedy said to me, you know, I've got another person that, you, that, that may be interested in having you work with him. And that's Senator John Sherman Cooper of Kentucky. So 
Morris Wolf tells me this, and he says also, I should tell you that while I worked for Senator Cooper, I was invited to uh, what he called soirees or parties at Senator Cooper's at 29th and N Street in Georgetown. And you know who I sat right next to, uh, Mark? Dorothy Kilgallen. And again, you know, I just, what, what? And he tells me all this and he said, yeah, she was there. She was a bright light bulb. She was always asking me questions about the senator and what was going on and so on and so forth that way. And he just described that whole situation. So I looked it up, which you would do, Patrick. And those <laughs> and, and uh, Cooper did live at 29th and N Street. So there's another little, you know, corroboration of what he's telling me. So he said, and then, Mr. Shaw, I have to tell you, and I'm just writing as fast as I can, can, as you can imagine. He said, you know, Senator Cooper used to take me with him in his sob to the Warren Commission hearings. And I sat right in the back and I listened to the testimony. And I noticed right away that at those sessions, there weren't very many of the members there. The whole investigation was being car carried out by staffers. Well, as you can imagine, that's another thing that, that uh, uh, Hoover was able to do because he's looking to control everything. He can't control all these members, but at least most of them he can, but he can control staffers. And that's one of the things that uh, Morris told me about what uh, Cooper said to him. So he says, as we're in the car, these are some of the things that he said. The commission members already know about Jack Ruby's connection to organized crime, but they don't want to touch it. It's more than Oswald, but Hoover and Chief Justice Earl Warren keep pushing the Oswald alone conclusion. Our new president, Lyndon Baines Johnson, now wants to cover up and move on. The commission members want to bury the truth under a pile of stones, and Earl Warren is acting like a third world dictator. And then this one, and there's, uh, there's other of these in, in uh, Fighting for Justice. They, the commission members, say, looking into the Oswald conclusion, it's good for God and country. But Cooper said, there is internal corruption, and I don't know why. And what I did to corroborate a lot of that, because Morris told me that Cooper was a very close friend of JFK's. And I have photographs in that book and new ones of Cooper and his wife being at JFK's home with Jackie, and they're having dinner and all this kind of thing. So you have to, re to think about the fact that when JFK died, Cooper was intent on finding the truth what happened to his, as to what happened to his friend. So that was what I had, you know, and I, I was pleased with that because it was it had really uh, be, been able to, uh, you know, give new information to what had happened with the Warren Commission. But then the, 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 the heavens opened uh, because and I missed all this. Everybody missed this. I was able to go ahead and, you know, oral histories are a great uh, tool for an investigative reporter or a historian. So I found out that Dr. Or, excuse me, Senator John Sherman Cooper had an oral history at the University of Kentucky, and Senator Richard Russell had one at the University of Georgia. So the first thing I did was I went into uh, Senator uh, Cooper's uh, oral history, and uh, unfortunately, I saw a memo in there, uh, which it, which I, was written on December fifth, nineteen sixty three. Something strange is happening. Warren and Kotzenbach, Kotzenbach, no, that's the, uh, you know, acting attorney general, know all about the FBI and the apparently and others planning to show Oswald was the only one the commission is to consider. This is an untenable position. I must insist on outside counsel. So that was a big deal, you know, that I found that memo. But you know what? I had the wrong guy who wrote it because when I, and I admit, admit my mistake, I went into the oral history of Senator Russell, who is a, a Democrat from Georgia. He's right there in that photograph. And he, oh, oh don't, let me forget to say this. One other thing Morris Wolf said to me, if you wanna see how upset uh, Senator Cooper was about the uh, uh, final report, look at the photo on the, on, uh, uh, of them giving the report to Lyndon Baines Johnson. And what you'll see is, this is him, right there, uh, just to the far right, and he's actually hiding behind Representative Hale Boggs, okay? And by the way, that's Senator, Senator Richard Russell over here, because he was ashamed of the commission's report. So what did I find when I went to look into uh, Senator Russell's oral history? Well, I found a, a, a document 
of Senator Cooper's that was in Russell's oral history, but not in Cooper's. September 18th, 1964. With these points before him, Cooper says, Richard Russell formed, forced a final executive session of the Warren Commission. Now, September 18th, 1964, six days before the Warren Commission report was filed. His main agenda was to present his pre prepared dissent and to refuse to sign the commission report unless his dissent was included. After presenting his concern, Russell was joined in his dissent by Senator John Sherman Cooper and to a lesser extent, Representative Boggs. In an oral history conducted late in his life, Senator Cooper recalled that Russell's well-reasoned opinion had great influence on Cooper's own conclusions. Like Russell, Cooper was impressed by the strong and compelling testimony of Governor Conley and thus was willing to follow Russell's lead in rejecting the single bullet theory and the Oswald alone conclusion. Cooper, it seems, was struck by Russell's emphatic refusal to sign a statement that categorically concluded that one bullet had struck both Kennedy and Connolly. Although he did not go so far as to prevail at written dissent, Cooper was willing to join Russell in a minority report. So that meeting was held. And it was decided that Russell and Cooper with Box were going to refuse to sign that document, okay? So I found that, and that's history, that, that there was this, this, uh, this, you know, they were going to disavow the final report that had nothing in it about the dissent, uh, it, no, the final deport, report, if it, had, if it didn't have that dissent in there, that they did not believe in the single bullet theory, and they did not believe in Oswald alone. Mark, and can I interrupt you for a second? Mark? Sure. Okay, if they uh, didn't believe in the, in the single bullet theory, what was their alternative theory? Well, that, that's an excellent question. Let me, I just, I, I want to give you one more document and then I'll explain exactly what they wanted to do and why it was impossible. Okay. So this is from Sen Senator Russell's uh, oral history. Uh, when he finds out that there's no dissent in the report, and that no evidence of that dissent, a copy of it existed. After the final commission report was delivered to the president on September 24, 1964, the commission was disbanded and the members had little reason to re review the final draft. Now remember, uh, J. Edgar Hoover required a, a code of silence from all of the members. They signed it and we can show it at some point if you want to. Uh, that they would not talk about the uh, what they were doing with the hearings while they were conducting them, and they would never talk about it afterwards. And they didn't. It was it was a shut door. Had Russell done this, reviewed the final draft, he would notice immediately it contained no mention of any dissent over the single bullet or the Oswald alone. He resumed its con congressional duties, assuming that his opinion had been documented and taken into account. That means he believed that the September 18th uh, meeting, an account of that, would have been preserved. More than three years after the commission report, Senate investigator Harold Weisberg attempted to gain access to all of the Warren Commission transcripts, but he sent a, a message to the archivist for the United States, uh, I'm sorry, in a letter dated May 28, 68, James Rode informed Weisberg that no verbatim transcript of the September 18th 18th meeting existed. There was a document in, in, indicating a structured account of general business, but nowhere was there any mention of Russell and Cooper's dissent. Russell's attempt to, to document his doubts for history had been foiled. Then, during a chance meeting in, with Russell in 68, Weisberg told the de senator that the draft of the Warren Commission report uh, with its dissent uh, no longer existed, that the official transcript record of Russell's doubts of the, as well as those of Cooper and Boggs had been expunged from the historical record, meaning no mention of Russell's exception to the proposed draft of the report existed. Early in the life, the commission, the members decided all, ex now this, this, if this doesn't floor you like it did me, I'll be surprised. Early, this is the, this is the extent that Hoover uh, you know, uh, LBJ, Warren, whoever it was, went to never let the American people know 
that there was anything to do with the dissent. Early in the life of the commission, the members decided that all executive sessions would be recorded by Ward and Paul, an established Washington firm. During a September 18 meeting, Russell recalled the presence of a woman in the room and assumed she was the official stenographer sent by Ward and Paul. However, she was not, since a survey of Ward and Paul records shows that the last session the firm billed for was a September 15th deposition. It is thus possible to assume, Russell wrote, that the presence of a stenographer was meant to deceive all of us and other dissenters into assuming that the meeting was being transcribed as usual. But this the thing, all I'm getting from this, well, can I interject? Just something? let me just finish two more paragraphs. Okay. The presence of a doctor transcript proved that someone, most likely Warren Commission General Lee Rankin, at the behest of J. Edgar Hoover, assured there would be no record of dissension in the ranks. When confronted with the unmistakable proof of a hoax, Russell was shocked and appalled. When he returned in Georgia to 1970 to film his farewell address to his constituents, he knew that he was dying of lung cancer. Seizing the opportunity to make his position known, Russell stated quite plainly that he was not satisfied with several aspects of the report. He told an interview that he refused to sign the report until they added the dissent, but finally did so, but he was never completely satisfied in his own mind that Oswald did plan and commit this act altogether without consult consultation with anyone else, and that's what a majority wanted to find. Five years after his death, Russell's central, central concern involving the Warren Commission came to uh, a pass. The evidence was evaluated by a second body, and that's, uh, you know, the uh, uh, House Select Committee on the Assassination. The commission's work was found to be wanting, but there was nothing in there about the shock that was shocking and generated headlines. There were too, too much. The, the commission had done its uh, job too well that nobody ever got to the bottom of all of this. And there was nothing, by the way, in the House Select Committee on the Assassinations or the church report later on having to do with this dissent. Although there had been doubters and critics have foreseen by FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover during his commission appearance in May 64, they were mostly dismissed as paranoid lunatics and conspiracy theorists. While the dissent of such prominent figures as Russell, Richard Russell and Cooper could have let a certain legitimate of various critics, the majority had been too effective in guiding public opinion. The wide variety of books and film proposed a host of conspiracies and other theories that numbed an increasingly jaded public to new findings. That's from the oral history. That's not something I made up. That is, that is history for sure there. So you see the extent they went to with destroying documents, making the members believe that, and, and, and uh, destroying documents, telling them the dissent would be, Cooper and, and Russell would be in the final report, and it wasn't, they lied to them. And then... Uh, telling them that they were, you know, that the, the document about the dissent had actually existed when it never did. It never did. But what I'm saying here, I mean, we've heard the song before. Not this. You've never heard this anywhere. Well, those facts Johnny, don't mean I'm anything. Saying. It's not going to change history, unfortunately. You yes, have it to is. Not so frustrated. May I tell you why? Why? Because no investigation of the JFK assassination can start without looking at the Warren Commission corruption. And I'm going to get back to your question. Just a second. I'm getting back to your question you asked a little bit earlier. What would what would Russell and Cooper and everything have done? If if there had not, if there had been, just think of what it would have been like if the dissent would have been in the final opinion. It would have opened the door to several investigations other than Oswald alone. They would that's have why it's the not in They would look at the mafia. Excuse they would look at the Cubans and all those people. Mark. And that can be done in, in view Mark. of what happened at the commission. All what you're saying, we've heard before. There's no going to... Nobody's ever been of, inside the Warren Commission, Gianni. But who's going to let you do it? Nobody. No, that's this is what Morris Wolf was there. This is what he tells us. This is what the oral history tells us. I'm I sorry. Know, in today's day, in the life we're living right now, and the people who are controlling Washington, do you think they want to open this up? No, not yet. Maybe at some point they will when we get all this information to somebody that cares about history. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about influencing the the uh, the, the, the rhetoric, the 
uh, conversations about what happened way back then. Because I'll tell you what, uh, I've told you before, uh, Dorothy Kilgallen, by the way, all of her research and all of her columns and everything else that she wrote substantiate what I've just told you. And she was there in Dallas and she knows it all. Uh, also, so she didn't get the justice she deserved when she died. Neither did Marilyn Monroe, as we talked about. But neither did John F. Kennedy. On the 30th and 60th anniversary of this, there's got to be a fight to get him the justice he deserved with a thorough investigation. And I think I can get that done with all this new information. Mark, when you're talking about an investigation of this historical import, uh, you're absolutely right. You have to have 100% transparency. So even uh, with 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 what you're saying, and this is uh, groundbreaking because it's it's never been exposed before. Mm -hmm. Even if if it's all a lie, what you just said, and even one thing is true, it creates a pall over the entire commission report. And I agree with you 100%. You can't leave things out uh, and say that this is a, it, everything was transparent. We put every possible thing in that report we could possibly put in there. You cannot say that. So uh, mm -hmm. if, if, if we know that now, the report isn't worth the paper it's written on. Even if there's one thing that was exposed and you exposed quite a few things, but even if there's one, mm -hmm. the report goes out the window. It's not transparent. So uh, it, 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 it can't be taken as the truth. Moving on from that, do you really think that after all these years and all these theories and all the arguments and all the legal arguments and the uh, uh, and, and everything else that's been said about this assassination, that anybody would even consider reopening this again? I do. I can say that, th that they could come to an agreement that this was a disingenuous document, but to reopen it? There's no, no, Mark, Mark, who, who do you think is going to do this? I'd like to hear this. Yeah, me too. Well, I, I think you have to pick the time and place for it. But if there is enough publicity about this out there, and there's enough people who believe that there does need to be a reinvestigation of the JFK assassination or of Dorothy's death or of Maryland's, at some particular point, an agency or one of the subcommittees or somebody like this, we've got to get through the wars. We've got to get through all the craziness with the elections and everything. But I had to bring this out now because it's fresh material. Oh, and no, I, it's important that you do that. Just, just let me get an example. Yesterday, uh, after I gave that presentation of the Cal Club, uh, the, uh, one of the uh, uh, legislative, one of the congressional uh, legislators from uh, San Mateo, which is pretty close to me, got in touch with me. And he said, I want you to send all the information that you have. I still believe there are people out there uh, who will want to reopen this at some particular point. All I can do on my end is provide the information, but I, I'm optimistic that at some point there'll be enough people. I'm also sending this to some of the uh, individuals who were involved back then to try to see if they won't you know, come forward and say, yeah, enough is enough. We need to be able to give JFK his due with an with a independent investigation of what happened. I think you have to take this one step at a time. First, you have to uh, proof which you already have that this was uh, a false document it was disingenuous it was slanted once that's established and people agree with that and they cannot not agree with that you've got it you've got the proof mm -hmm. then you have to go after finding somebody who would want to reopen this investigation and while i find the former thing evident and people will admit that what you have mm -hmm. is definitely valid i doubt I mean, I'm coming, you know, I'm I'm coming at this from uh, an investigator's point of view and a cynicism that that uh, mm -hmm. uh, pervades law enforcement. It's going to be. Uh, I can't say it's impossible. Nothing's impossible, but mm -hmm. it's very, very, very difficult for people who want to relive this. Should it be done? I agree with you. It should be done. We should have mm -hmm. open and transparent investigation. Will it be done? I can't see it. Well, I can't what? bury this material, so well, I'm, I'm going to get out there should... every place I can in the New York Times think... and everywhere else, and maybe somebody will say to themselves, come on, you know, it's time to investigate this independently. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm an optimist, okay? And I believe this, 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 I don't know why this stuff all comes to me, you guys. I don't know. <laughs> well, you know, you're right. You're an optimist and I am a cynical bastard. I spent too much time, <laughs> I spent too much time in law enforcement. Uh, I still love you. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm crazy <laughs> about you too. <laughs> but
but uh, it's it's going to be an uphill fight. You have to create enough stir, uh, uh, you know, enough media attention to mm -hmm. the fact that this is a phony document. I mean, you've proved that they left stuff out. They didn't offer an alternative theory. Doesn't make a difference. They were forced to leave things out. They were given promises that it would be in, but it's not. Well, why is that? Let's declare this an invalid document. Then you'll, you'll have a much better chance of having this thing reopened uh, one step at a time. But you, you have to get people on your side to say yes. I want it to happen now. Okay, how about tomorrow? <laughs> it's getting late. Jeannie, can you help me? Can you, <laughs> can, you go to Washington? can you go to Washington, my research, and find me some clown out there that'll want to do this? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, we, 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 I think we all agree, and even our audience, we, we've heard the myth. We understand it's a cover, right. but it's the government. Yeah. Exactly. What, well, what are we going to do about the government? We get yeah. one idiot at a time in the White House. They're not going <laughs> to open the door. They don't want this out there. It takes the limelight off of them. It, it may be bring attention to them. Well, not only that, it's, this is bringing up this is old history. People, uh, you know, I can't use the word tired. A president got killed. This is a tragedy. But the people are fed up and tired of listening to it. As a politician, I just picture some politician who say, yeah, I, I, this is what I'm going to, to devote the next few years of my life to, is reopening this and convincing people. I don't think you're going to find that person in a political atmosphere. You get a well, very wealthy guy uh, in the private sector ah. that's going to put the bill. Different story. Mm -hmm. But not, but not politicians as we know them today. <laughs> what I was hoping through all of this with with Gianni, that I could make like a poster, and he could kind of carry it around yeah. when he's. We must <laughs> investigate the JFK assassination again at his at his performances and things like that. But I haven't heard him say that he's interested in doing that yet. But we're going to put Gianni on Second Avenue with a sandwich board. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, you know what it is? It's, it's, I've been hearing this, from, I've heard it early on from people who, who knew this was what was going on, as you did Mark also. Even with Dorothy Kilgallen and Mark Sinclair. Mark and I have had conversations after he found her and mm -hmm. he knew what was going on. But mm -hmm. what's, what's a hairdresser going to go do? <laughs> you know, it's the credibility yeah. that people who want to go carry this banner. Me, this, they're going to say, oh, he's only trying to sell books. No. They're going to find sure. a way to discredit him. That's the only reason. No, listen, well, I, I, for one, as a, as, as a writer, and I told you this in the past and in our private conversations, I'm very impressed with your research. If somebody held a gun to impressed my head... Impressed or impressed? Impressed. Oh, okay, I thank thought you. he said you're, that, too. Your, somebody held a gun to my head and said, I want you to do a little digging and see if you can find anything that will uh, overturn the, the conclusions of the Warren Report. I would say, shoot me now, because this is time and effort. And I really yeah. admire that. And you've devoted oh, yeah. a portion of your life. Well, and uh, uh, and that, that's, that alone is impressive. Uh, but uh, the, 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 the cynicism in Washington today is not, this, the Washington of today is not the Washington of the 1960s. And look oh, what God. they did then to this report. Can you imagine what they're going to say now if somebody wants to reopen it? We need somebody very wealthy. In the I like that sector. idea. I, I, I think I'm going to go look at the end of that. Yeah. I personally vote for Gianni to fund this project. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> well, you know, it's it's funny you should say that because of the fact that I, I spoke to Johnny Rosselli. I spoke to people who were involved in this. And I knew from day one. I, I didn't have to wait for the Warren Commission. I didn't have to wait for the Magic Bullet show. I knew what was going on from day one. But you I mean, know, I, I left. I left the country for twenty-two months over this. Mark, I don't know Mark, how many other people did. <laughs> Mark is absolutely right. It's got to be official. Police people have to believe it. You know, it's obviously the the information that you got is one hundred percent believable. It's on the record. People spoke to you. That, that's a given. Step one. You have to find a a philanthropist, a donor. There's, there mm -hmm. are people out there, I'm sure, that are very wealthy that would mm -hmm. possibility that you could talk to them and say, this is what I have. I mean, if, if I had had the money, I mean, I've been interested in this assassination on a on a, an academic mm -hmm. level for many, many years. I taught a class on it. 
I mean, ah. if I had the money, I'd be writing you a check now. There's got to be somebody out there. Let's take a break while we're talking about money so we can make some money. We'll be okay. right back. <laughs> we know where you are. We are pleased to announce the publication of a new book series from Gianni Russo and Patrick Piccarelli entitled The Sixth Family. When the alleged daughter of Marilyn Monroe asks for help, Gianni Russo becomes entangled in a web of lies and violence in the search for the late actress's diary. Soon, he is enmeshed in a mystery that involves a presidential candidate, a disgruntled Mafia Copo, a retired NYPD detective, and the past of Mafia boss Frank Costello. Russo must race against the clock to stop a hostile reorganization of the American Mafia while trying to stay one step ahead of a faceless killer. While listening to this book, skillfully read by Gianni himself, the listener will have to determine what is true and what is fiction. Or as Gianni says before this epic story begins, this book is a work of fiction, except for the parts that are true. Look out for the second installment of this exciting new series coming in 2023. The Sixth Family. Book One is available now on Amazon.com. All right, we're back. Mark, let's get 20 million. Let's start a yeah. let's start a fund right now. Mm -hmm. Go fund Mark and let's find out what happened to Jay. Oh yeah, they have those, don't they? Go fund and stuff Hello? like that. Oh yeah. And you won't believe yeah. how much money is contributed immediately. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that. That may be possible. But you brought up Roselli, and you just think, you know, for instance, if there'd have been a dissent in there, they would have looked into LBJ, perhaps, and his involvement with the oil companies and all that. I found a Russian document that said they could tie him to organized crime. And then you've got uh, Marcelo, the mafia people. You've got the CIA. You've got all of that. They would have there could have been investigations into that, but they just closed it all down because uh, Hoover was protecting himself, and he didn't want to be investigated for heaven's sakes, right? Well, no, well, I mean forget about it. Hoover was so locked to Costello, it was ridiculous. Ah, uh, yes, for sure. No, and then I, I mean the, some of the people you're talking about, I was definitely directly connected to Marcelo, especially. You think he wanted to give up his kingdom down there and have people? Yeah at it and and roselli the only reason roselli is was killed as i mentioned off the camera mm -hmm. is he was claustrophobic yeah and they knew when he was going in to testify that they were just going to keep hitting him because he was going to say i take the fifth i take the fifth they got all of them in contempt and keep mm -hmm. giving 80 days or whatever it is and he couldn't hear break so they you see him. why then i only write about dead people Mark, let me ask you a question. <laughs> did, 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 Mark, right, Jeannie, I'm not going to get in one of those drums. Hold on. Question. Did the church committee offer uh, uh, immunity for testimony? Uh, uh, you know, I, I've got that document right over here. I'm very impressed with it, by the way. They really did point a lot of the discrepancies in the, yeah, they in did. the uh, Warren Commission. The dissent stuff wasn't in there or the House Select Committee. But no, they weren't. They weren't as as interested in that. They were interested in analyze the investigation by the commission. And they, at one point, they say, by the way, that the that Hoover was at odds, you know, uh, with with the uh, uh, you know with the powers that be because he felt like that the FBI was being persecuted. He was really upset with some of the commission things they were saying about the FBI that they did nothing wrong, and and. You know, uh, Cooper told Morris Wolf he, he was very, very upset. And he finally, and I have it, he wrote a letter of resignation to LBJ. He didn't send it, but it said in there, and, and just think about this. Uh, I'm very upset and I want to resign because you aren't telling me when witnesses uh, of interest like Oswald's brother will be testifying. And so I haven't been there for that. They purposely, you see, Kept a lot of those people. You know, it's interesting. You can you can see, of course, uh, Cooper uh, hiding behind Hale Boggs. But one of my supporters, I get all of these emails and everything. And, uh, you know, there's almost 10 million views of my um, presentations and interviews up on YouTube. But he, one of them said, hey, look at the face of uh, Alan Dulles looking over at Cooper like, 
hey, I know you. I know you're a dissenter, you and Russell. And he couldn't let that happen, see? He couldn't. He was protecting the CIA as well. So they were all protecting something there. And, and uh, Katzenbach, the acting attorney general, was there to protect the Kennedys from any investigation of, of fixing the 60 election, any complicity by Bobby Kennedy with Maryland's death. They were just, I mean, they were smart. Hoover was a smart guy. I mean, you got to give him credit for that. He was a corrupt individual across the board. Just, just think about that situation. Did I tell you that Morris Wolf was, was going back and forth between the uh, attorney general's office and the White House when he worked for RFK on his bicycle, taking secret, secret messages from the president to the attorney general because they knew that J. Edgar Hoover was tapping their phones? Well, you know, that, that means it, it just, um, again, I, I mean, it's a situation that I don't know how. I mean, I hope it happens. I'd like to see what, you know, because I, I spent a lot of time with Jay, uh, uh, John F. Kennedy. You know, mm -hmm. he was with him almost six months every weekend. Mm -hmm. but, uh, no, I mean, and we all, the people that know, know that's not how it came down. So it's... Uh, no. And, and, you know, this is the 60th anniversary. And, and to commemorate that, I was talking to a colleague the other day. You know, JFK had his flaws, you know, his womanizing, all the different things that happened. But if you look at, at what was going on and what we lost when he died, we hoped he'd get us out of the Vietnam War. Hello. But before that, he and Bobby had, uh, had uh, pursued civil rights and the Civil Rights Act of 64 that LBJ signed. They worked hard on that. JFK and, and Bobby Kennedy, I'm not a fan of, of Bobby Kennedy, especially his son, uh, Bobby Kennedy Jr., who's waltzing around telling oh, all these insane. stories about what, uh, what his father said in terms of how JFK died when, uh, JF, when Bobby Kennedy, uh, you know, told all of his colleagues he knew it was the guy from New, New Orleans. But, um, you know, they, they saved us from a nuclear war. With the, with a missile crisis, so yeah, you, you I mean, have that, to remember some of the great things that the Kennedys did while they were around there. Well, what they were trying to do also was give a socialized medicine like Europe. That would have been a great thing too. I don't remember that. Is that right? Oh yeah, they were trying to create. So they wanted John F. Kennedy on one of his platforms it was to get socialized medicine medicine passed ah, to know American that. citizens. But, I mean, there was a lot. I mean, we could go on and on and on, but it's a situation like you're pointing out. I can't believe that Robert Kennedy Jr. is going on television. And I, I did the math on this. He's telling us that his father told him that the CIA killed his uncle. Not true. So now picture me waking one of my nine-year-old kids up and say, I want to let you know who killed your uncle. They don't even know what we're talking about. I mean, this man, I, who's backing him now? That's what I, I can't even understand. He's running on a private ticket now. He's running, a, he's, he's running as an independent. Yeah. I know, but where's the money coming from? Well, he's got to have somebody because I don't think he thought of that all by himself. Well, that's what I'm saying. And his family's not, his family's not putting up the money. Yeah, I know. Oh, no, no. They don't want anything to do with that. He's no. not coming well, out he, of the he's trust. Got support, I guess, but he's, he's been quiet of late. You don't hear much out of him the last couple of months. Because most people know he's done. Yeah. I think he's done. Probably. Oh, Jeannie, 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 what do you think of all this? You well, you believe that I'm going to get an investigation, don't you? Absolutely. Right. Like sure. you say. No, you know what I was thinking? It doesn't, it just is a repeat of, it, it's always been corrupt in the government. It's what it sounds like to me. Yeah. All the secrets and the things that they're just going to tell you what you want to, what they want you to know. And they'll keep hidden whatever they want to keep them out of trouble, and and they'll and, bite and people this is 60 off. And, years we're yeah. approaching sixty years of this myth. Right. Well, that's before I was born, but I've heard about it my entire life. Oh, you yeah. know, and and so I listened to that. The one name that you you keep uh, talking about, and I even asked you guys once. Um, that's how I got to know these guys, Mark. I've heard all of your. All of the times that you've been on the show, and I've always loved it. And I wish like crazy I could have met that Dorothy Kilgowan because she sounds like oh sassy and she fun little person. lady. But um, yeah. uh, Boggs, that guy ended up dying. Him and another, was oh, another yeah. senator, uh, both of their plane, or they were on a plane that disappeared. Is that over Alaska or something? Yeah, yeah that's always 
it's always been a mystery. You know, there are true crime murder mysteries here. There's JFK, there's Dorothy, there's Marilyn, but Boggs, nobody's ever been able to, you know, I wouldn't put it past. Well, I, I can't remember when he died. Does anybody remember when that was? In the 70s. 70s. Uh, they never located the, the plane that went down, as I recall, or did they? I, I don't think so. And so yeah. you wonder when you're saying people didn't come forward, you think maybe people tried and maybe maybe there were things going on that maybe somebody got a conscience and, and wanted to say something. But it just, it, it and it may, yeah. it may be different than I recall, but are the records that will be unsealed after so many years? Is that? They get, they get unsealed periodically. Most of them have pretty yeah. much been unveiled and, uh, you know, and, everything. Everything. and it all goes to Oswald alone. Yeah, yeah, and the thing is, you just there. you just never know what to believe. But I like you know? your box idea. I'm going to look into that uh, because I was surprised. I did not know until that document I read to you that, along with Cooper and Russell, Boggs was one who was going to go along with the dissent as well. I never knew that, and of course, that made him an enemy of of anybody on that commission for sure. So thank you. I'm going to look into that. Uh, Mark, there's a very good podcast, and Jeannie could probably tell you more about Hal Boggs and his disappearance that's still on uh, iTunes. Check it out. Yeah. Okay, I will. What's, you know, name, of, what's the name of the podcast, Jim? I'll find it. I'll find it. All right. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, those are those are the things that got me. Uh, I, I don't remember how I read across these guys, but I thought, well, I'm going to ask Gianni. He knows a, a lot about a lot of things. He's got an inside track to a lot of different things mm -hmm. in history. It's yes, seems. he does. And, so, yeah. That's because when you I'm that old, thing, that's all. <laughs> what did you think Because I'm Gianni, part of history. <laughs> the question is, Gianni, do you ever have lunch with Hale Boggs? No. Okay. The only guy Bill, you oh, Bill Boggs I like. <laughs> Bill Boggs. <laughs> Bill Boggs I like. <laughs> uh, boy. So Mark, well, thanks, uh, thanks for having me on here, you guys. Oh, no, Mark, always. Oh, don't go anywhere yet. What's in your future? Well, I'm going to march to Washington <laughs> these days and try to get Are you working something on done where I'm going to hit up all the millionaires that I know. But uh, I don't know. Uh, it's amazing how this material comes to me, but I think this might be enough. I've written six books on the assassination. I, I, I put together uh, all the, the manuscripts in one file the other day. I've written 950,000 words about this. I think that's enough. You know, I, yeah. I don't know where else I would go with this. If you so get, I'm going to move on to probably something else. If you get the right person, they will listen to you and believe you, and you have the research to back it up. I mean, it's. Uh, are you working on any other books? Are you, have you started anything? Well, I've I've written a uh, uh, series of uh, of novels about a uh, flamboyant criminal defense attorney just like me uh, when I practiced in the 1970s, and uh, he's got his band of of uh, of. Uh, helpers who solve high profile crimes and things like that. I've worked on that on and off for years, so I may do something with it. But uh, my wife uh, wants me to retire. No, I don't uh, do that. I, I, do have some health, I do have some health issues and I have to watch myself with some things, but I, I frankly don't know what I would do with myself. I probably would jump off uh, a bridge because, you know, retirement isn't for everybody and it's not oh, for no. me. So. I'm a very, very blessed man, and I'll just kind of see what happens as uh, as time goes along. How well, old are you, Mark, if I can ask? 78. I made it to 78. I'm three years older than you. I'm see, not, we're doing all right. And, I'm and not going to retire. Uh, <laughs> uh, now, Patrick is 81 or 82. I can't remember. 80, 83. 83. Oh, he's not. He's younger than me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm 77. Oh, okay. We're right there together then. Yeah. Yeah. Well, anyway, All right. thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, again and again and again. In, in fact, we're, we're going to change this to the Hollywood Godfather podcast starring uh, Mark Shaw. Well, I just want your promise this way. If somebody calls you and says, you know, I, I want to get involved with this. I've got some money and I was I love JFK and he got a raw deal. And I hope you'll pass that information along. Oh, oh, definitely oh, will. Well, if you By do doing as you speak, then, no. it's being passed along as you speak. Our audience is listening to us. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Do, and my website, you, have... you know, is markshawbooks.com. My email is mshawin at yahoo. I answer all the emails. 
I, I, I did get an interesting, if, if I got just a few minutes, a, oh. a couple of minutes. Yeah. I did really find out the truth about the JFK assassina assassination the other day. I get all of these emails from people. I open them, and I got one from a woman in Maryland who said, Mr. Shaw, the person who shot JFK was Jackie. And she did it on the lawn <laughs> of the White House. Uh, she was upset with his womanizing. She asked one of the Secret Service agents for a gun. She shot JFK. They threw the gun in the bushes, and then the CIA helped them hide the body. Okay. What, now, what is she first. smoking? What is she smoking? That lady. That's right. <laughs> Somebody knows. get the story and, and go with it. <laughs> yeah, you might as well make a movie out of that. That'd be funny. So, oh, I, I can tell you this, if you don't mind. Speaking yeah. of movies, uh, a, a screenwriter and I and a producer in L.A., we have a script for oh, a film really? about Dorothy Kilgallen, the reporter who knew too much. There you go. That I want to watch. Who, so who, it's being looked, looked, uh, looked at around L.A., and we'll see if uh, anybody uh, feels like they want to produce it. So that's important. The whole Maryland stuff is in there and everything else. But really, it's about Dorothy's courage in, uh, uh, you know, powerful men. She made a lot of enemies of powerful men. And it's a true crime murder mystery. And so we'll see what happens with that. But I uh, have some hopes it might happen. Well, well good luck great. with that. And, uh, luck. Thank, thank you for being here. You'll all be invited to the premiere front row. All right. For sure. Absolutely. Hey, right. Mark, that, that podcast is called Missing in Alaska about uh, oh, help. Good name. Missing in Alaska. Thank you so much. I'll look at that tonight. Okay. My pleasure. All right. Thank you so much. I love okay. you all. Thank it was you. nice meeting you. Have a good night. Bye bye. Hey, thanks. To our audiences everywhere, thank you for your support. And we gave a, we got a lot of clues that can help support us. Like Jeannie said, her friend said, if you make a comment and recommend or share, our audience is going to explode. We just can't wait because we're just talking to you and us three here. So if you're listening, tell the world. God bless. Have a good night, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. And that was that. Thank you for tuning in to the Hollywood Godfather podcast. Do you have a question for the mailbag? We love hearing from our fans and answering questions about past or future episodes, your favorite celebrities, or anything you'd like to know. Submit your questions online at hollywoodgodfatherpodcast.com or you can call us at 646-776-3038 and leave us a message. Who knows, your question may even make it on the air. Remember to follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Hollywood Godfather and at Real Gianni Russo. If you like our show and you like what we're doing, please leave us a review on your podcast or video streaming service. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button so you never miss an episode. Now we'll be back next week with a new exciting show and who knows who may be joining us. Until next time. I never get too old to have a little fun. Come on, I'm Gianni Russo. A genuine one of a kind. What a ride it's been, this life of mine. And I ain't done yet. I'll be back until next time. And that was that. Hey!